Okay. You said about proof that this is a big win. Yeah. Um, but I think the proof requires giving examples of how you would use what you're asking for, this late binding. So, you know, an example in my mind, I'm not sure that it quite counts, is a lot of the aspect oriented programming okay, yep. ideas sure. Sure. involve composing yeah. programs at a relatively low level. Correct. Yeah. So if you can if you can modify the compiler's idea of what a particular construct means inside the compiler's tree, and you can say now when I uh, read or write a local variable, I'm not going to actually read or write a local variable. What I'm going to do is invoke some function somewhere saying I would like to read and write this particular piece of state in this particular <coughs> context in this particular object. Um, you can do a lot of the sort of aspect dynamic aspect weaving type things. Now uh, you could even modify the code that is generated for reading and writing a local variable if you wanted to wrap it with some kind of you know, active uh, property. Okay, so that's one thing that aspects maybe would do for you. Um, so being able to modify what the compiler is doing, and we'll get to that in the slide. Or okay, fine. So maybe I'm just uh, Re reaching ahead of where you Yeah, you are reaching a few slides ahead. Uh, programs are data and so on. And yeah. uh, this, uh, what's the story about encapsulation and uh, abstract data types? Um, you are. Well, we'll get to that as well. You, okay, are, you, you are free to implement your own type systems or to extend the simple type system that comes with this kind of language um, to encompass anything that you want. And uh, if you want to do encapsulation, and I, I have a little story about, uh, it's actually a reference, I have a URL about uh, security and how to make it bulletproof and how to do it trivially. But it requires you to go read a website. Um, okay, so we do all of this late binding stuff, we do all this dynamic stuff, and we do it for the uh, uh, the simplest possible definition of everything. Um, I think Einstein said something about simplest possible solutions generally being the good ones. Um, so the simplest possible definition of everything, to my mind, is the platform's native code speaking the C binary interface and with some the minimum possible connection to whatever makes that platform useful, whether that's libc, POSIX thing that you export or whatever. And then assume absolutely nothing about everything else, including whether or not it's mutable and including whether or not you can treat it as first class and by default everything will be first class, everything will be mutable. Then expose this everything to your application's runtime in the simplest and least constrained form possible and then go have fun because what you can now do with a system like this is build maximally dynamic systems on top of it with minimal effort. So the, uh, if you remember back to the, to the virtual virtual machine diagram, the sort of primitive through VM implementation and through uh, processor glue, the vertical slice through the middle, is what eventually became known as the YNVM, which is YNVM is not a virtual machine. Um, it has all of the same properties as a virtual machine. It smells just like a virtual machine, and many people when they see this thing think there are bytecodes happening underneath there, but in fact it's not. It's a dynamic compiler which, in which everything that is expressed in the source input causes some piece of native code to be compiled and executed and maybe thrown away immediately because it is just more effect defining a variable, for example, you generate some code, it defines a variable, then you throw the code away. The input is, uh, is structured form, you can reason over it. It's uh, language architecture independent uh, and there's a tiny little object memory in there just to store these input structures uh, and you can store any kind of metadata in parallel along with that. Um, we've already talked about programs equals data equals meta to any power you like data equals programs. Um, the compiler itself is built in such a way that um, semantics uh, are completely uh, are completely soft within the compiler itself. When it sees a particular structure on the input, it looks at the current environment, its compilation environment, uh, to figure out what to do with that particular construct in the input. And there are, um, there are there is a concept, of a very lightweight concept of namespaces which give a context to the compilation <coughs> currently underway. Um, and so in a, a, in a restricted domain, I can redefine what any particular semantic construct means uh, inside the compiler. And uh, this is done to the best of uh, my abilities at all levels in the compilation chain. Um, and what I said about um, getting to the outside world, there is one primitive within the system which is just DLSIM. And if your platform doesn't happen to have DLSIM, you can emulate it very easily. So this is what it looks like. It's a tiny little object memory with a tiny little GC which normally does not ever run because it's just there to clean up your 
Uh, if you're building a, an object-oriented language, then of course the first thing I expect you to do is to build your garbage collector in this thing. Um, there, there, is a, there are some textual front ends for this, although they're completely optional. The real input for this is just data structures. Um, uh, there's a tree compiler which takes these structures, turns it into some abstract code, which has the C semantics, and uh, it's slightly extended C semantics, um, but it's stack-based. Um, there is a, an optimizer, there's various things across this, a uh, code generator that then does register allegation and all sorts of code generator type stuff, uh, with a portable backend that's uh, it's a few hundred lines to port this to a uh, to new backend. Uh, and then the code itself is emitted in your C heap. And when you're finished with it, since it's generated in a, in a piece of memory that's been mapped, you can just free it and it goes away. Um, so inside again, uh, in this diagram, there are some structures in here. If you want to define a variable, this looks like a list, but it isn't. It's just a parse tree. The node tree is defined, and the two subtrees are x and 42. Um, we feed that, oh, I apologize, this is, uh, this is partially in French. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we feed this in here, the compiler does its stuff, generates some stack uh, stack code onto this virtual process, which then generates some code, which then gets executed, which bundles 42 in some new location somewhere over here, and then gets free. Okay, so you get the idea. Now, what's important in this diagram is uh, coming up in two slides time. Um, What's important are two things. First of all, well, there are many things, but I don't have time. Uh, the story about symbols is important. Uh, a symbol uh, within your, your meta universe, the universe of uh, compilation, can store three things. It has three attributes, rather. It has a, a primitive value, which you are free to use as you see fit. That's really what you consider a, a variable. There's an object value, which is used really in the meta universe. Anything that's an object value gets traced by the GC, etc. It can store metadata, and you can choose what metadata you want. And then there is a syntactic value, which gives that particular kind of node in the parse tree the uh, semantic meaning to the compiler. And absolutely everything is built like this. There is no privileged stuff in there. Uh, everything is built using the extension mechanisms that you can get to. And the way the extension mechanism works is that everything inside here that defines a compilation context and a meaning for stuff inside the compiler can be modified by just generating new data code and then attaching it to the correct point within the system itself. Um, so the runtime implements a dynamic compiler over its own implementation domain, and every semantic operation can be modified in a restricted context if necessary uh, as a user-defined extension. In fact, all the intrinsics are just user-defined extensions that are there when you switch the power. So no privilege meaning, you can modify anything any way you like. And um, so going back to the earlier diagram, what we now have is a whole load of green stuff with no red stuff. And because we have swapped the compiler for a dynamic compiler, made it part of the runtime for the application or the data implementation, whatever you want, um, we can then introspect on our own execution and modify ourselves as we see fit. And we've used it to build virtual machines. Uh, we have uh, one of my grad students made a Java virtual machine that sets in class files that uh, I just compiled the JDK. There's a class file that you can run it. And the implementation of that JVM, which has a full JIT inside it, generates uh, real native code off the method. The implementation is 3,000 lines of code. Um, it's not quite as fast as the hotspot stuff, but it's a lot faster than any of the pure Java interpreters. Uh, we built active networks with this stuff. We built embedded systems with this stuff as well uh, to generate operating systems on the fly when you switch to power on. We've also done self-modifying systems connected to HTTP traffic monitors to make uh, self-adapting web proxy caches, etc. So the kinds of things you can do, again, this is not a list, but it's not. It's just pieces of parse tree. Some of it uh, generated dynamically. One minute. This is what uh, an inline cache looks like implemented in this. And you build a little uh, message dispatch system with this, and you uh, benchmark this stuff, and it comes out as a 1.9, one, twice the uh, amount of time to make a dynamic dispatch in this dynamically implemented dynamic dispatch. So this is some compiler functionality we have on the fly. When we compile a program using this uh, functionality, uh, the performance comes out as less than uh, twice the time to make a static C function call, which is about as good as you get off something like Objective C. Um, the catch is people are terrified of too much flexibility, so we need uh, so we need to make um, stable intermediate forms. And if you uh, know the parable of the watchmakers, it's a, it's a nice little uh, fable 
uh, that explains how with watchmaking you need to find stable intermediate forms if you don't want to go out of business. Um, in the